Yep, we're back at it again, with possibly the only live-action movie coverage I'm doing all year. It's Home Alone again. One of the greatest movies of all time, and timelessly on loop every Christmas season. We make a new Home Alone video every year, so check those out if you're craving more of the Christmas season. But this year, let's keep it simple with the scene that changed Home Alone. What is the single best scene across this masterpiece? What was the secret core piece that resonated with audiences to become an example of eternal iconage in the film industry? I mean, there are loads of options. Typically, we all come for the action sequence against Harry and Marv, but there's also the heartfelt discussion with Marley. My god, I just looked up the casting for character names and Robert Blossoms was looking fine back in the day. Anyway, other options are, of course, the ice cream sequence, the shooting a gun, the shopping sequence where the bags get broken, screaming Kevin in the plane, the look what you did, you little twerp, the overslept frantic morning, all sorts of things. But scrolling through all of the options we have, the scene I want to talk about today is the one whereby Macaulay Culkin, Kevin McCulkin, Callister actually sets up against the big final act. We come off the cuffs of the friendly scene with Marley over in the church as Kevin learns some words of wisdom as well as not to judge a book by its cover. And so he says his goodbyes. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. And so with that last story beat done, it's time for what we've all come here for. But after five Home Alone sequels didn't scratch that itch in their reinterpretations, yes, there are five sequels including Home Alone 2, and more if you include unofficial dog attempts. Let's see how the original tackled the task. <laughs> so punctual and so simple. Not to mention it splices between diegetic and non-diegetic sound by using the bell toll as the starting beat that then leads into this remix, essentially. Oh, Of course, since we're leading to a montage, we're not going to be getting much in ways of dialogue, but it's the attitude of the score that really starts bringing it together, with an immediate kick in to get us pumped up for future events. What follows next, strangely enough, is Kevin returning home but it's not a simple cut to him at the front door. No, instead we get to watch in a series of long takes Macaulay walking across several vast streets. All the while the soundtrack is still going hard in the background. Perhaps it's just so we have more time for that soundtrack to sink into us audiences. We've really got to milk the composer while you can. Perhaps it's because the filmmakers know that for any good build up, you need to take it slow. I mean, look at how much runtime this movie has on setup over actual confrontation compared to the sequels. Or perhaps it's just the style of more traditional filmmaking. Quick cuts and skimming corners is much more common in the script font of modern day movies. So maybe it's just a remnant of the old long takes of the past. I don't know why it's there, but I do know it works. Until eventually, Kevin makes it home. This is my house. I have to defend it. And thus, we kick off into our montage. Future reboots may try to replicate this moment of a final word before the action. Locked and loaded. But it doesn't hit the same, and so it begins. This shot, again, is pushing on my limits of only being able to show six seconds at a time. For just simply showcasing a drawing of a battle plan, it sure does take a bit of time to reach it, when a simple pinning on the wall could suffice. But that's exactly it. If each setup piece is perfectly placed off screen, then you lose one of the most integral traits of your underdog kid protagonist, relatability. Kevin is kind of wobbly rolling it all out, he's a little out of his depth, and that only acts to humanise him more as he's set up against this monstrous task. It's so simple, and probably just a subliminal detail, but it's something we lose so quickly when trying to strike lightning a third or fourth, fifth reboot of dog time. Here's Kevin placing down Legos, the score now using lighter instruments as it's kind of a small thing, like a Tom and Jerry interactive soundtrack. Big bass for big movements, and lighter instruments for the small stuff, and composition to give us a little more context as to where this is being directed to, with the door in the background commandeering about half of the frame. We won't always get that kind of context, but it's good to start clear for your first example. And though the zoom in is just following through, it's nice to see Kevin actually adjust one of the trucks, as if every small detail matters. <laughs> And like here, you're a little more in the dark as to where it will lead. I mean, to me, it's probably one of my favourite traps of the entire film, considering the perfect delivery it leads into. <laughs> oh. 
And though it might go over some audiences' heads this time around, at least it's still clear where it is so far, easing audiences into the mystery with each montage step. And now we've evolved into a full-scale mystery shot, kind of. It's always nice to see regular homely props used for another purpose as we only see a single hand grabbing some kind of prong out of context, but what really shines is the extra effort added to incorporate a second hint in the same shot, with just a simple pullback to focus on a chair and residing tarantula. Establishing it again to remind audiences of its existence, as this was initiated earlier in the film too when Kevin collapsed Buzz's shelves and accidentally released the thing. Not to mention, having an unexpected element that even Kevin doesn't realise makes the whole sequence seem all the more interesting as not even the mastermind kid knows where this is going, as well as makes him not so omnipotent and overpowered. Oh, I bet they loved when the tarantula finally moved on cue. Here's a follow-up piece of context in the very next shot, hence why I said kinda. Though as we haven't gone full out of context just yet, it's just another step in easing us in. And you know, it's actually quite gripping to see a little bit of VFX in this shot. I'm not quite saying I want a full-on CGI home alone in a sci-fi setting, I'll, I think, but suddenly seeing a glowing red hot prong ups the stakes a little and gets you invested to see how it'll come into play. Maybe I do want a sci-fi home alone. If they're gonna retry to hit this itch anyway, might as well set it in space or something. Or fantasy lands. <laughs> More water and more stairs, and though you could probably pass the, just the back entrance going down to the basement, it's a bit tougher to tell with this swiftness of the shot. Plus, you're always wondering if this is actual water or some mysterious chemical Kevin has access to. Of course, for that, Kevin will have had to actually interact with it already in this film, as every trap piece is essentially foreshadowed during all of Kevin's Home Alone escapades, which is just great storytelling. Tar displayed in big clear text on the side of the can facing the camera. What's getting progressively less clear is where we are. Kinda looks like some kind of desk at first, and the lighting suggests it's the basement, but actually it's more stairs. I quite like the ambiguity of some of these shots, and it gives just a hint without full on spoiling exactly what fate awaits our bandits. And now we finally have no context at all. This is just a piece of arts and craft built at a crafting desk. And a nail sticking through some paper is all we have to go on. You never know, it was made for more stairs. Unless you're supposed to surmise we're free for free on stair prep. And a nice little tap for extra flair, as any kid would probably do after this project. You just can't resist. <laughs> And now we're upping the scale as Kevin runs outside towards his little treehouse, camera pulling up before we switch 180 degrees to face the other end of the rope attached to the top floor. I was wondering for the longest time how Kevin feasibly fit the rope into place here, but it makes a lot more sense going from house to treehouse than trying to fix it the other way around. He just had to throw it all out the top floor before this shot to the treehouse. Anyway, Kevin now has fixed it in place with a tight knot. Light illuminates him clearly against the dark exterior and establishing a direct link between the two buildings. Nice. It's not all weapons that are being prepped in this montage. Here's some non-contextual glue, and again, it's nice to see just ordinary props used elsewhere as well, like how the salt and pepper are acting as paperweights for the plastic food wrap we're gluing to. This later is used for when Harry walks through a door, and to feather him up. Speaking of... Here's the feather fan. Probably not needing much more clues to assume where this is going. It's literally like something out of a cartoon. And since you're halfway in, consider subscribing, or become a member if you'd like some early access perks. It's optional, and cheap, and our current members have the next video already. And in keeping it Christmassy, since we've mostly just used general utilities up to this point... We've got everyone's favourite crunchy carpet hazard. Bit of an odd placement for them, until you realise this is exactly where Kevin spotted Harry last time when putting up the baubles in the first place. And here's the start of one of the most iconic attacks, the swinging paint can.
almost unrecognizable without the pendulum movements, and are lingering on that shot for more of the tarantula, in case you forgot. And so that concludes our montage of preparations. Funnily enough, the film likes to blur the line for a bit of humor as we return to the slice of life with a simple shot of a room Christmified with lights and a microwave. Perfect for heating up some other trap, but no, it's just dinner. <laughs> a kid needs to eat. And seeing him grab the hot plate with two oven mitts used incorrectly is again just that perfect little extra taste of flavor to showcase how he's still a kid and doesn't know how to handle everything himself perfectly. He's just an engineer at heart who will tackle it in his own way. It's such a simple gesture on the director's part, but it is so, so endearing to coloring your character correctly. And thus, as the robbers come driving into place and they discuss their plan of action, how do you want to go in? We'll go to the back door. Kids are stupid. Ugh, even this moment alone adds so much to the whole sequence as it's setting up for the satisfying turnaround by having these villains so clearly underestimating Kevin. Kevin may make one of the best versions of Kevin we've ever seen, but these villains as well do so much of the heavy lifting to really sell their ultimate downfall. We're now perfectly set up for the bandits who underestimate this kid, and a mansion full of goofy entrapments. We equally have a good chunk of context to guess what's coming next, as well as still being in the dark since many traps weren't shown at all. But for one final kicker, we come back to Kevin just trying to enjoy a Christmas dinner, as that is the true spirit of the season, even if he doesn't have his family to share it with this time. Bless his highly nutritious microwave or macaroni and cheese dinner, and if people are sold in on sale. Amen. He's a little confused, but he's got the spirit. And once again, it's shot as a simple slow take with the camera slowly zooming in as Macaulay Tolkien tries to deliver this lengthy, complex line. Until... It is time. Interrupting even his makeshift Christmas, how symbolic. But no time to be Macaulay Sulkin, so he blows out the candles, runs to the door, and gives us one final word before the big act. This is it. Don't get scared now. Not some big overconfident stance this time, but one of real courage, as he's probably saying this because he is scared in the back of his mind, but has the tenacity to power through. And from there, the robbers are succinctly tripped, burned, glued, smashed, scared, swung, and twonged over the next 14 minutes. But none of it could have been achieved so satisfyingly if not for the carefully plucked collection of setup both immediately beforehand and scattered across the entire first two thirds. What was the secret ingredient that had Home Alone succeed so well here when future installments failed? Probably a tumultuous amount of things. The lengthier shot cinematography, the build down of context, the relatable fumblings, the small details, the spiritual essence of Christmas, and the masterful score throughout. All of it comes together to create a product that's clearly made by expert craftsmen with an eye for detail and care. Whatever the secret source is for this formula of a movie, it's clear that the original has all the rest beat. And this scene that changed Home Alone is just one piece of a masterfully crafted piece of work, and forever plagued us with repeats that missed out some of these core traits. Thank goodness we can always return to the original. For now though, my name's been Daz. You didn't really care. You know, I was originally gonna make a seven hour like super essay about all the Home Alone movies and how to make a good Home Alone movie, but I just lost steam for it. So I'm putting this here to get it out there that next Christmas, I'm gonna actually do it dissecting all of the Home Alone movies, pointing out all of their flaws, and depicting just what's needed to make a damn good Home Alone movie. You can put me to that. It's out there now. Go check it out if you're watching this Christmas 2023. And I'll see you in a bit.